What's up everybody, to Daryl White here, the senior pastor of the Forward Christian Center, and boy am I excited to bring to you the word that you are about to receive on today. It's a message entitled, You Already Know. So listen, do me a favor, I want you to do something, I want you to pull your Bible out. We are going to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 11, verses 2 through 6, for a message entitled, You Already Know. But listen, before you do that, do me a favor. Make sure that you click that subscribe button. We are now entering a campaign entitled The Roll to 1000. We need a thousand subscribers. That's our goal. So we encourage you to be one of those individuals, not only to uh, click for that subscribe button here on YouTube, but also go to Facebook and like us on Facebook as well, Forward Christian Center. All right, it's work time. I'll be back in a minute. We are going to the gospel that's recorded by St. Matthew chapter number 11. I want to drop a few verses in your hearing. We shared this message in the 834 worship experience, and we want to share it here in this one with you, that there might be congruency across the board, and everybody receives this word on today from the gospel as recorded by St. Matthew, chapter number 11, and we will lift up verses 2 through 6 from the King James Version. We're going to Old Faithful on today. And if you don't have a Bible, you can look on with someone. If the person next to you doesn't have a Bible, look on with the person that's sitting to the other side of you. And if ain't nobody around you got a Bible, find you some new friends. Amen. Oh, no, I'm joking with you, man. But if you do not have access, the scriptures are on the screen. Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse number 2. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or should we be looking for somebody else? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he, emphasis statement in verse 6, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Can we all say amen? amen. I want to look again to verse number 3 at the query that is made, the question that is asked in verse number three, it says, and he said unto him, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Uh, look at somebody like they've been getting on your nerves for the past six weeks. Just look at them like they've been, like they've been getting on your nerves. That's a good one right there. I like the way you looked at her. That's a real good one. And tell them, you already know. You already know. Look at somebody else. Tell them, you already know what's up. You know the deal. Stop tripping. You already know. That's what I want to preach about. You already know. I have to admit that I am not usually moved by the actions and the activities of people. Nothing much surprises me about what people do. I'm not surprised because I'm convinced and I'm well aware that in this shell of humanity, we also have to deal with the frailties of humanities and the frailties of humanities can often become realities. Paul was very clear when he vocalized a very potent point when he said that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so I try my best not to act brand new when I find out that people are not God. <laughs> when I discover that they have their own areas of insufficiencies and weakness, it doesn't cause my heart to pump a tater on my forehead to perspire because I found out that somebody had a weak moment. But I have to admit, I have to admit that in reading Matthew chapter number 11, it got to me a little bit. 
it really moved me. And whenever I look in a text, I have to give myself to that passage. Because if I don't give myself to that passage, I've learned that what I give to the word, the word gives back to me. So I have to give myself to the word. I have to give myself to the passage to not only acquaint myself with the content of the text, but the characters of the text. And what really bothered me about what we just read in your hearing is the individual who asks the question, art thou he who should come or should we be looking for another? The New Living Translation says, are you the Messiah that we've been looking for or should we be looking elsewhere? It surprised me at who asked that question because the person who asks that question of Jesus was John the Baptist. Now, let me say about John the Baptist that if anybody should have known who Jesus was, truly now, should have been John the Baptist. I don't want to insult your biblical intelligence. I know that you already know about the relationship, but allow me to reiterate, to recapitulate the relationship between John and Jesus just for the sake of the fact that there may be someone who is here today for the first time. I will, I will submit to you that John should have known Jesus forthrightly because of the fact that John and Jesus were first cousins. They were from the same family. As a matter of fact, they were uh, six months apart. They were cousins. The same natural blood that flowed through the veins of Jesus was the same natural blood that flowed through the veins of John the Baptist. They, they were related. Their, their, their mothers were related. As a matter of fact, if you can recall, when Elizabeth was pregnant with John, Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus at the time, went to meet her cousin. And they greeted one another to share the good news that both of them were not only pregnant, but they were miraculously pregnant. For Mary became pregnant by way of the Holy Ghost, which was a miracle. And Elizabeth had become pregnant in her old age, which was a miracle. They were related. John should have known who Jesus was. As a matter of fact, it was John who introduced the world to Jesus. It was John who, who literally put Jesus on the stage. It was John who gave Jesus a platform because it was John who stood in the middle of the Jordan and pointed out Jesus and declared in John 1 and 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Truly now, if you are to say something like that about somebody, it would imply you got to know who they are. It was John the Baptist that he had to help ease the tension with the people of that day when he began to talk to them about his relationship with Jesus. And he declared, he says, please don't get it twisted. I'm just the best man. But Jesus is the groom. He must increase. But I must decrease. You don't say that about somebody that you don't know who they are. The relationship with them was was tight. They were close. They knew each other. As a matter of fact, this is the one that really got me the most, Keonti. It, it blessed me the most because John knew Jesus even before they were born. For the Bible says that when Elizabeth met Mary at the salutation, at the meet and greet of one another, the Bible says that the baby John the Baptist began to leap in his mother's womb which means that he had a revelation of who Jesus was even while they were both in their unconscious state of mind. So truly now he has to know who Jesus is. And that always bothered me because how could he have a revelation of who Jesus really was while he was in his mother's womb? And here it is some 30 years later. Now he has to ask the question, are you the Christ 
or should we be looking for another? Isn't it interesting that the unconscious John knew who Jesus was, but the conscious John was struggling trying to figure out who he is. Therein is a glorious revelation, and I pray that you're spiritual enough to receive this. You have to be careful in 2019 not to let your thoughts talk you out of your revelation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't, don't let how you feel talk you out of what you know. It, it is this John who should know Jesus, yet he asked the question, art thou he that should come or should we be looking for another? And the question is, why would John ask this question if he should know the answer to the question? And I'm so glad you asked. Y'all a smart class. You ask all the right questions. But you don't have to figure out the answer. I'm here, so I got you. I'm going to tell you why John had to ask this question. It's because life happened. Look at your neighbor and tell them life happens. Before you pass judgment on a person, you may have to consider that life happened to them. Something about trials and tribulations. Something about heartache and pain. Something about being lied on a few times. Something about having your, your heart broken. Something about having your trust violated. Something about being let down. Something about having a rug pulled from up under you. Cause life to happen and cause you to question whether or not God is really on your side. You don't have to look at me, but I'm looking at you because you don't want anybody else to know. But I'm spiritual enough to know. I got discernment enough to know and understand that there's times in all of our lives where we wonder where is God in the midst of all of this. Especially when it looks like God has ordered your steps. When it looks like he has positioned you in the place where you are and the place where he has assigned you now begins to be filled with all types of calamity. You wonder if God is really in all this. God, if you put us together, then why are we arguing like this? God, if you gave me this job, then why did they lay me off? God, if you gave me this house, then why am I struggling to pay the bills? God, if you gave me this car, then why is it looking like every time I turn around, it's breaking down? If you did this for me. Who's ever been in that place where you had to ask God some questions? You, you, you may not want the person sitting next to you to know, but God knows that you've had your share of moments where it looks like every time you turn around, something else keep popping off. You, you can't win for losing, can't kill nothing, and won't nothing die. Life happened. John turns around one day and discovers that he's in a position that he's never been in and to add insult to injury don't forget he's done everything for Jesus he's been the man for Jesus he's he's been the the, the forerunner of Jesus he's prepared the way for Jesus he's the one that has introduced Jesus to the whole entire world to the whole entire region he he's been that man and here it is He's in a bind. And it looks like to me that if Jesus was going to show up and be there for anybody, should have been John the Baptist. When somebody bent over backwards for you, when somebody been preaching your word, when somebody has been loving you unconditionally, they get in trouble, watch this, and Jesus, don't get scared when I say this, wasn't even nice enough. To go visit John while he was in prison. Let you get sick. And yo BFF. Don't come visit you. That BFF won't be your BFF no more. John's in prison. And Jesus went putting that on his books. John's in prison. And Jesus wasn't going to offer him prayer. He didn't even send the prison ministry team. I see why John's offended. I see why John's upset. I, I can see if I was one of those people that just went to church every now and then. But I'm always there. 
I could see if I was just one of those people that would support you every now and then when I felt like it, but I was always supporting you. I could see if I just went to some of your preaching engagements, but, but I was always by your side. We, we've been down since day one-ish. Now I'm in trouble and you won't even come see about me. Where they do that at? I'm with friends like that who needs an enemy, right? If this is what loyalty is, then give me disloyalty. If this is what unconditional love is, then just give me conditional love. Because, because if, if, if I can't depend on you when it's raining, please don't come smiling in my face when it's sunny outside. Come on, talk to me when you get to church. But, but this, this is the kind of stuff that makes people want to walk away from God. That makes people want to walk away from the church. Because when I needed you the most, you were not there for me. Isn't it funny how people will be there for you when you don't need them? And then they'll try to brag to you about all the times they were there. And you look at them like, I ain't even need you for that. You, you just showed up because you wanted to. You, you were just there out of that convenient support. But, but I really needed you when my back was against the wall. You showed up when my back was nowhere near the wall. You showed up when I was on the mountain. I don't need you to help me celebrate. I can do that by myself. I needed you to help me fight when I was down in the valley. But where were you? Wonder John's questioning are you the one or should we be looking for for somebody else so somebody in this room you've been asking that question about Jesus but you ought to be asking that question about some people in your life are you the one or should I be looking for somebody else because when life happens it causes you to question the authenticity of every relationship in your life John wants to know why I'm locked up and they won't let me out. <laughs> and you won't even come and say, can I do anything for you? He's offended. Let the church say offended. offended. That's a word that you hear. We've heard that so much in the past three or four years in church and in Christendom because for some reason or another, everybody feeling some kind of way. Everybody's in their feelings. Everybody, everybody's in their feelings. Eight out of ten people in their feelings. I'm telling you, man. Hey, just count off ten people. Eight of y'all in your feelings. Two, two might be all right, but eight, eight feeling some kind of way right now. Just, just, just mad. Just angry. Just, just upset. It's almost like we enter into environments hoping to find reasons not to remain there. Looking for reasons not to go to church anymore. Looking for reasons not to serve God. Look, looking for reasons not to give. Looking for reasons not to share. Looking for reasons not to be faithful. Looking for reasons to, to feel like we are in a privileged position to dog out other people. Just looking for some way of escape in order that we might accommodate our oftentimes illegitimate feelings. But there are three things that cause people to become offended. If you got a moment, I'll share them with you. Three reasons reasons why people get offended is right there in your bible here's number one write it down instigation people get offended by way of instigation i believe that instigation is a spirit it's a spirit it's a realm it's an attitude it's a way of operation you don't even think about it. Spirit of instigation. What is instigation? Instigation is the idea of putting thoughts into people's minds negatively that were not there initially. You left the meeting feeling good. Somebody went and got in your ear and three days later you mad about it. Talk to me when you get to church. If you don't say amen, I'm going to thank you to instigator. <laughs> You were cool, you were fine, you were happy, you were straight until somebody came and gave you a reason not to be good about it. Instigation, the, the, the spirit of instigation. Back, back in the day, back in the day, uh, we would have somebody, it was almost like they, they could have been done kings of the street because they were, they were promoters of fights. You gonna let them talk about you like that? You gonna let them say that to you? Ooh, dog, you talking about your mama. 
Can, can I tell you? Can I tell you when you're in the presence of an instigator, they say one word, ooh, ooh, ooh. You better watch out for all the ooh people in your life. The people that try to change and thwart your way of thinking in order to match something, watch this, that would cause them to do something that they can sit back and laugh at. The instigators. You gonna let them do that? Child, if it was me, they wouldn't do nothing either. Well, listen, child, if it was me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that if I was you. And how do you feel about that? I feel all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, man? No, go on, say it well. I'm just saying. <laughs> Watch this. And now, respectfully, because many of us are so weak minded, we will let somebody pull us from the table where we eat. And the problem is the person that pulls us from the table ain't got no food in their hand. Are you here with me? This deep church today, this deep church, this, this heavy church right here. Because you, you'll let somebody that don't go to church pull you from your church. So they ain't growing spiritually. So they'll pull you away from where you're growing spiritually. And now both of y'all getting ready to fall into a ditch. Because you got offended by somebody that was an instigator. What do you see instigation in, in, in that text? I see it in verse, number, in verse number two. I don't see that in verse number two. That's because you ain't looking right. Here it is. Now when John, here it is, had heard in prison. Let the church say heard. heard. That means John can't see what's going on. Somebody had to come tell him. Somebody had to bring the news to him. He heard in prison about what Jesus, check this, was doing on the outside. So John started thinking, you doing all that on the outside, where's mine? You see, it's beautiful to hear when God is blessing other people until somebody reminds you about what God hadn't done for you. It's beautiful to attend other people wedding until folk keep asking you when you gonna get married. Now all of a sudden you tell yourself, I ain't going to nobody else's wedding until it's mine. <laughs> Don't ask me, I ain't getting no dress, I ain't being no bridesmaid, no maid of honor, no major of honor. I don't want to be no groomsman, I ain't finna be no ring bearer, none of that. I don't want to be no host or hostess in nobody's wedding. I ain't trying to be no usher. If I ain't the bride or the groom, I ain't going to nobody else's wedding. Now you're offended because somebody has instigated. In essence, here it is, somebody has controlled your thinking. Look at your neighbor like you're concerned about their future and tell them you need to start thinking for yourself. Yeah. We become offended because of instigators. Can I tell you the second reason why people become offended? They become offended. Somebody sound like they're interested in this word. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know. I'm going to tell you what else caused you to be offended. Here's number two. Write it down. It's on the screen. Isolation. Being by yourself. I don't see that in the text. That's because you ain't looking right. It's in verse two. I ain't went nowhere. That is, he heard when he was in prison. You can help me preach this. He was in prison. That's isolation. I ain't never been, I ain't trying to go. I don't even want to think about it. But it seemed like a lonely place in there. Yeah. Nothing to do but think. Isolation. And isolation can cause you to become bored. It ain't in the Bible, but then your grandmama tell you that an idle mind. Some of y'all tripping like that is in the Bible. No, it ain't. No, it's not. I read all 66 of them books and it is not. <laughs> Somebody offended now. I ain't going back to that church because he said a night of mine is a devil workshop is not in the Bible. <laughs> I like preaching to y'all. Y'all make it fun. Isolation. You become bored 
in isolation because there's nothing to do. Especially when you are used to being surrounded by the public. A lot of pastors, you may not believe me, but a lot of pastors deal with depression on levels that you don't understand. And I ain't just talking about national, I'm talking about locally. Someone called and asked me, like, man, do you ever have them lonely moments where you just feel like you're about to get depressed or something like that? And the reason is because we are surrounded by people. We, we preach to people. There are people come up to us after church, but that church is that one day a week. And because, yes, sir, absolutely, you got that revelation. Some of them grown folk need to get that revelation too. That baby anointed in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, going to be some. He like me too. He going to be some. That baby love me, I'm telling you. <laughs> Isolation is that thing that will have you get into a place where you are offended, watch this, by moments that you are used to, but they ain't happening right now. So what do you do when your expectation is one thing, but your experience is another thing? What you thought and what you went through were two different things. Y'all all right? How you thought it was going to be and what it really was were two different things. Some of y'all got connected to somebody. You thought it was going to be one way, and now you can't stand that joker. Y'all so quiet in this Presbyterian church. Y'all be making me sick sometimes. You, you got that job and thought it was going to be one thing, but it turned out to be something else. You got that house, thought it was going to be one thing, turned out to be something else. You got a car, thought it was going to be one thing, turned out to be something else. You're like, Lord, just take this piece of junk. Because when your experience does not match up with your expectation, you are in isolation, you're by yourself, you feel like nobody's fighting with you, you can become offended by that. I thought you would be with me. Oh God, don't be the kind of person that, that has to have people around you in order to get your assignment done. Don't let somebody walk off and leave. Oh my God. What? I mean, my, my God. I mean, not, not understanding that sometimes the people that start off with you won't end up with you. If you ain't prepared to lose, Y'all ain't talking to me. You see, when you, when you are not dependent on God, you will become desperate for people. People who are desperate for people, they are not depending on God. I'm going to say that again. In Easley, Alabama, I'm going to say that. That people who are dependent on other people, desperate for other people, they are not dependent upon God. You looking at me like I'm scared to say, I'm going to say it one more time. If you are desperate for people, that means you are not dependent on God. You appreciate people, but you cannot be desperate for people. Your help going to have to come from God who am I preaching to in this room here's what you need to understand about isolation so that you don't become offended too fast isolation it may be that thing that causes you to be bored b-o-r-e-d but don't overlook your need for God to get you on board b-o-a-r-d let me tell you how a wise preacher put it a wise preacher put this a couple of Sundays ago his name Kendall Latham he said this It's okay. Slow but you're worth waiting on. I'll catch up with you later. It's all good. He, he said this. He said this about Jonah. He says, isolation is not for your recreation. It's for your preparation. That's what he said. That's what he said. That, that was pretty good right there. Which, which, means, which means that your isolation, this is what I'm saying, is not for your fun. It's for your focus. If God got you by yourself, you mad because it ain't enjoyable. God ain't trying to have you to experience joy. He's trying to get you to experience him. Because you need isolation for preparation so that when God puts you on a platform, you ain't got to be scared to death when it's time for you to perform. If you miss what you need in isolation, then when God puts you in front of people, you're going to blow your whole assignment because you wasted your moments of isolation. Who am I preaching to in this room? He is offended because he's in prison and Jesus won't come get him out. He won't set him free. I thought you came to preach deliverance 
to the captives. If I'm a captive, you ain't preaching to me. Are you the one? Or should we be looking for another? Because the Jesus I thought you was wouldn't leave me like this. The Jesus I thought you was wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't let me be in jail and not see me. Some, oh, I don't know if I need to say that. Got Facebook looking too. So, so, I, I can go on and say, you got my back, you got my back, 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 you got my back, throw your hand up in the air, throw your hand up in the air. All right, now when it's time to fight, if I don't see you, I'm be like, man, you threw your hand up for nothing. <laughs> At your cousin them church, it's some members over there got sick. They mad that Rem didn't come see him. That's why they left the church. He ain't come show up. He ain't come see me. Let it have been somebody else. He'd have been right there. <laughs> Forget all the years that he preached and helped develop your conscience, help you, help you to um, get your focus straight, who challenged your faith, who, who corrected your focus, who went co sign on your faults. Forget all those years. Forget those moments. He didn't show up when you were in the hospital. So now you mad. Watch this. You so offended that he didn't come up to see you until you forgot to thank God that you made it out the hospital. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. You, you offended by who didn't show up when you need to be thanking God that God showed up and delivered you from where you were. Because it don't matter who come visit you in the hospital. If God don't want you to get up, you going to stay there. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. High five your name and tell them don't be offended. Stop being, stop being so mad about everything. Tell them stop taking everything so personal. You ain't that deep. I know you don't want to hear that. You ain't that important. Folk don't go home and think about you 12 hours a day. They just trying to keep me from it. They ain't stunning you like that. Folk too busy trying to get their blessings. They ain't trying to keep you from yours. I don't care what kind of blessing you get long as I get mine. I don't want what God got for you. I want what God got for me. Who am I preaching to in this room? I ain't gonna never try to take nothing from you. I just don't want the devil trying to take nothing from me. Offended by way of Isa. That's the second one. Here's the third one. We finna raise up. We finna go home. We can all go to Applebee's after this. Here it is. Here's the third thing that causes. I'll stop. I'm trying to look good for Facebook stuff. It's going on YouTube later. Here's the third reason that people become offended. What was the first reason people became offended? Who took notes? Instigation. What's the second reason people become offended? They are isolated. Here's the third reason folks get offended. This is the one gonna speak to your cousin them because of discrimination. You get discriminated against and you are offended. You are at the point of exasperation. You are indignant. You ready to fight. 38 hot. 38 ain't big enough. You 357 high. You got 357 reasons to just lay off into somebody. Discrimination. I don't see that in the text. That's because you ain't reading it right. It's in verse 2. I'm still in verse 2. Watch this. Now when John had heard, that's the instigation, in prison, that was his isolation, here it is, the works of Christ, meaning what God was doing for other people. He wasn't doing it for John. Blessing everybody else. Where mine? How you treat one? You're supposed to treat everybody. Can I tell you what? Y'all lend this one right here. I hate you feel that way. See, you offended that I said that. (laughs) 
Joseph made a got a coat of many colors from his daddy. Why he just gonna give it to one? How many sons he had? Twelve. If you're gonna give a coat to one son, you need to give one to all twelve of them. I'm glad you think that way. I'm glad you think that everybody's supposed to get treated the same. I'm sad you think that way, really. Okay, if you feel that you're supposed to treat everybody the same, married women, throw your hand up. Married women. All right, get up tomorrow, go across the street, and cook breakfast for your neighbor's husband. All the husbands, tell me what you're going to do. No, don't say it out loud. But no, you're supposed to treat everybody the same, right? But what you do for one, you're supposed to do for the other, right? That, 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 that's how it works, right? Okay, so if that's the case, if that's the case, then what's the benefit of you being my friend? If, if we're friends, right, that means that there should be something that I would do for you that I'm not so interested in doing for my enemy. When I was a boy preacher and I first started preaching, uh, actually last Sunday was actually 23 years I have, have been preaching, 23 years from last Sunday. But check this out. No, 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 I'm not saying that for applause. Pray for me. Pray for me. Because most people be saying congratulations when they enter in the ministry. You don't need congratulations. You need prayer. If you're going to do it right, you need prayer because this ain't fun. This is a fight. All right, but check this. I said that to say this. When I first started preaching, uh, 11 and 12 years old, I would get up and I would pray over the offering. I'd be right here. I'd pray over the offering. I remember when I first went over to New Hope and I prayed over the offering and I went up there and put on, you know, had my deep voice on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray now that you would bless those that gave and bless those that had a desire to give and had it not. Then I would even say this. I would throw this in there now. Throw this in there. Lord, bless those that had it to give but they were just too stingy to give. All the old folks shout, ooh, that boy can pray. Ooh, he anointed, baby. I like that prayer. Sounded good, but the Holy Spirit convicted me, said, then why give? If the same blessing that is reserved for the giver is going to be given to the non-giver, then why give? You still offended? Because check this out. Here's where Jesus needs John to understand that what I have for one person is for them. What I have for you is for you. What God got for that brother over there is for that brother over there. You see, God, watch this, he's so big that he ain't got to bless us the same way in order for us to be blessed. What God do for you, he can do something totally different for me. Everybody get a piece of the pie, but the pie don't taste the same. Oh, I wish I had me a praying church in here. What God has for you is for you. What he got for me is for me. What he got for your cousin is for your cousin. That's why I can't stand envious and jealous people to begin with. Because they don't understand the same God that has the capacity to bless one child is the same God that has the capacity to bless all of his children. Which is why you just need to thank God for what he's doing in your life. Stop hating on what he's doing in somebody else's life. Because if it is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he can do that and then some for But we get offended because of discrimination. So check this out. Last point, I'm done. We get offended over discrimination, which is why, but check this out. We say this, but we don't really get it. We say favor ain't fair. And it's not. Favor is not fair. We'll say, boy, let us get a blessing. Favor ain't fair, baby. <laughs> Got a brand new car. Everybody ain't able. And you look back at them and tell them, favor ain't fair. Got on some expensive shoes. Ooh, I like them. Them had to cost a lot. Yeah, I spent some money for these. Everybody can't do it. Favor ain't fair. Got a big old nice house, sending pictures to your friends. Ooh, that's big. That's beautiful. Everybody ain't able to get in no house. Baby, favor ain't fair. Right. 
We love to claim that as a badge of honor. Favor ain't fair. The problem comes in when we get the ain't fair end of the favor. You, you work a job. You get on there. You've been there six months. Another person been there 20 years. Y'all both apply for the same job. And after six months of you working this job, they promote you over the person that's been there for 20 years. You going to come up, Pastor, I need to tell you. I'm going to be like, what? And you're going to look at me and be like, favor ain't fair. I'm like, what you mean? I just got on this job six months ago. The person that was training me applied for a position, but guess who ended up with it? Don't say it was you. Favor ain't fair. I got it, baby. I got that job. I'm going to be making more on this job than I made on my last job, even when they laid me off. But look what the Lord has done. Favor ain't fair. Do you hear me? And we sitting there talking and you shouting right there because you're so excited that favor ain't fair. All right, flip the script. You've been there 20 years. Somebody else show up six months. They ain't got the seniority you got. Ha! They ain't got the years you got. They ain't got the experience you got. They fresh out of school. Six months. Lord, please don't let them be a light-skinned person. They've been there six months. You've been there 20 years. You both applied. They got it. First thing you say, baby, that's discrimination. And then if they light-skinned, you're going to say it's racial. You're going to pull the race card. You filing a grievance. You taking it. They, it's personal. No, they, they had to do some. They done brown nose their way. They had to sleep their way to the top. You got all these reasons why they got somebody else. Maybe the reason is favor ain't fair. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Favor ain't fair even if you catch the unfair end of the favor. Discrimination makes you offended. Somebody else got it and I didn't get it. Where am I? All your friends getting married. You still single. You ain't got no thighs in the bed yet. You offended. Preach white I am. Everybody else getting new cars. You still driving that one for 20 years. Where am I, Jesus? Everybody else moving up. Head with their life and I'm still stuck in the same place. No fun for me. It's not fair. I'm offended. I'm hurt. You walked by and spoke to one person and didn't speak to me. I'm offended. I'm hurt. You don't like me and it's personal. They don't even know you but you saying it's personal. Can I tell you why you so offended? Can I tell you why your cousin's so offended? Because you're making it about you. We can all stay in and receive the benediction right there. The only reason you are feeling some kind of way is because you're making it about you. Imagine how you would feel if you weren't making everything about you. So, the question is, since I'm in instigation, isolation, I'm feeling discrimination. I got to do verse 3, and we're getting ready to raise up. Here come verse 3. John sends his disciples to go to Jesus and say, are you the one? Or should we be looking for another? Check Jesus out with his smooth self. He's so smooth. Oh, my God. I don't just love Jesus. I like Jesus because he's so smart. He's so wise. He always knows what to say. He always has a dope answer. Check this out. Verse 4. Go and show John again, which means <laughs> I already know you've been talking to him, you instigator. I know. Go, go back and tell him what you already told him about the works that I've been doing. Here it is in verse number five. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, 
the dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Go back and tell them all that stuff. That should be the proof and the evidence that I am who I said I am because if I wasn't who I said I was, then I couldn't do what I've been doing. So you already know I am who I am for even Nicodemus declare truly God is with you because of the miracles that you do. You wouldn't be able to do it if God wasn't on your side. But here's what Jesus said. This is what messed me up. He said, tell him what he already knows, but then tell him something that he don't know. Tell him verse six. Tell John he'll be blessed if he don't get offended by what I'm doing in this season even though it don't include him. Boy, I'm finna walk off the stage. Y'all ain't ready for me. Here's what he's saying. Yeah, all the works that I'm doing People are getting blessed. They're receiving their sight. The, the, the deaf are hearing. The lame are walking. The dead are raised. But here's what I need John to understand. If you can just chill out while I'm blessing other people, I'm going to come back to you and bless you with what your eyes haven't seen and what your ears haven't heard. Let me see if I can preach it better. Sometimes God ain't blessing you right now. It's because he's trying to say the best for life. You ought to high five your neighbor and tell them that's my section right there. He's saving the best for last. He ain't got to bless me with a 19 model because a 20 getting ready to come. Oh, I wish I had somebody that will give God praise. You need to turn that frown upside down because God has not forgotten about you. Bless your holy name. Check it. Y'all sit down. We getting ready to get out of here. Sit down. You're making me nervous. Check this out. I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. Are we going to Applebee's? Call the order in. I want a riblet plate. Check it. All right. He says, John, please don't let me not coming to visit you cause you to become offended. Okay, p- please. I know you don't understand it. Listen, John, I know how you feel. I'm talking to you, John, and Johnetta. I know how you feel. It hurts you. Church hurt hurt you. I know how you feel. They walked right by you. They overlooked you. I know how you feel. That, that some have told you to their to your face they don't like you. I know how you feel. I know how you feel. Hey, hey, you did all that work and they left your name off the program. I know how you feel. <laughs> they didn't put your name in the obituary. I know how you feel. I know how you feel. I feel your pain, John. You deliberately, specifically, you knew you was going to be about five minutes late. You asked them to save your seat. Somebody else was sitting there. Hey, all the work you've been doing, they should give you reserved parking. But they didn't offer it to you. They didn't give it to you. I know how you feel. I'm talking, I'm talking to that preacher that's listening right now. You've been at that church all those years. You've been preaching 10 years and you've only preached twice in 10 years. I know you offended. Oh, you feel some kind of way. They ain't let me preach. Hey, they ain't let me pray over the offering. I know how you feel. I see where you coming from, John. Here's the problem. I also see where Jesus coming from. I finna mess with somebody's spirit right here. Can I tell you why you've been so offended? Because you only see things from your perspective. Jesus said if you're going to be blessed by me, you got to start seeing things from my angle, from my perspective. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not your kingdom, not your will, not your plan, but thy You ought to throw up your hands and shout, thy will be done. You ought to tell them, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, it's all right with me. If it ain't my season to be blessed, then I'll wait until my time. 
Hallelujah. We might as well have church. Come on and shake your neighbor's hand. And tell them, neighbor, turn that frown upside down. God knows what he's doing. He may not come when you want him, but he'll show up right on time. Is there anybody here? Don't wait till your change come. Because when God get ready to bless you, he going to bless you better than you would have blessed yourself. Ain't God all right? You ought to slip your arms around your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know how you feel. I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard thunders roar. I fell. Sin breakers dashing. Trying to conquer my soul. But tell them, neighbor, I heard the voice of Jesus telling me still fight on. He promised me he'd never leave me. He'd never forsake me. You can't always see him, but he's always there. Shake that neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, you can't always see him, but he's always standing right there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will feel no evil. Ah, he walks with me. Oh, he talks with me. He tells me I am his own. If you know he'll keep you, throw your hand up. Throw your head back. Shout yeah. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, don't be mad about it, sweetie. Don't be mad about it, bruh. God's got a bigger blessing waiting for you. So what? They didn't let you sit on the front row. What God got for you is better than sitting on the front row. What God got for you is better than a preaching engagement. What he has for you is better than your own parking space. God got something better than, than a boo waiting on you. He's got something that your eyes haven't seen. Your ears, I wish you would hear me in this place. Your heart hasn't felt what he has in store for you. If you would just let what they did to you go. Let it go. Let it go. Your next blessing, hear me, is tied to your ability to get over what people have done wrong to you. That's where your next blessing is coming from. Your ability to get over it. They mistreated you. I know. Jesus dealt with that same stuff. But look at where he seated at the right hand of the Father. Ever living to make intercession. Can I pray for you right now? If you would just lift your hand. I want to cover you now. Because I believe that what God is doing in this next season of your life. You're going to have to stop being so timid. You're going to have to stop being weak. You can't be sensitive in this next season. You're going to have to be hard on the next level you're going to. Because if not, people are going to take advantage of you. They're going to take advantage of your heart. They're going to call you weak. They're going to call you soft. And they're going to step all over you. God says, I'm placing you in the oven right now. I need to harden you up. I need to make you strong so that when the enemy no comes in like a flood, 
I lift up a standard against them and remind the devil that no weapon formed against you is going to be able to prosper. But you got to get your heart together. You got to get your mind and your spirit together. You got to get over the fact that he dumped you and that he left you and left you to raise them kids all by yourself. You got to plant your feet and square your shoulders and, and stick your chest out and declare that me and God are going to have to do this together. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every offended heart, every heart that walked away from you, that walked away from ministry, that walked away from the church, I pray, God, that you would give them a renewed sense of revelation to help them understand that nobody should have told us that the road was going to be easy, but we don't have the right to quit on you. We shall not give up on you because you won't give up on us. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would touch every mind, touch us from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet, and make us stronger, strengthen us where we're weak, build us up where we are torn down, and give us a fresh start, a fresh mind. Help us to fear no man, but only to fear you and to trust in you, knowing that if you bring us to it, your grace is going to carry us through it. I thank you today that we are receivers. We are recipients of your word. We receive this prayer that everything the devil thought he was going to do, we cancel his assignment right now. We cut it off at the root and we send it back to the very pits of hell and we declare Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down because we're bigger, we're badder, we're stronger, we're wiser and we're trusting in his only word. He never failed us yet and he will not leave us now we count it done in Jesus name if you receive that I want you to let those hands go and begin to give God praise clap like the devil is in between your hands come on give God praise for it Can y'all do me one last favor? I promise you I won't bother you no more. I want you to hug one person and tell them welcome to the new you. The stronger you, the anointed you, the focused you, the disciplined you, the ready you, the ready to take the world by the hand you. The you that's going to hang on to the world as it spins around. The you that ain't going to let people talk to you no any kind of way. The you that's going to plant your feet and declare for God I live and for God I die. Welcome to the new you. Thank you for letting me be myself again. You make all things new you I'll never get through preaching. I just have to quit, so I'm going to quit. But I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. No matter what If you can stop being offended, God got you. He's got you. No matter what it looks like, God, I will trust you. If somebody steals your bike today, I give right. it all to you. And then in the morning, you walk outside, and there's a brand new 2019 S Class Mercedes Benz in the driveway. What you gonna do about that bike? You can have that. You can keep that. Can I tell you all the stuff you've been offended about? God's got something waiting in your driveway for you. That you can tell the devil you thought that was going to keep me. You can have that. You can keep that. Next time you see your ex in the, in the mall with the new chick. Oh, you can have him. God got some. In the words of my late grandfather, James White Sr., he would often say, I've been helped as a result of that word. I pray that you've been helped 
as a result of that word. You already know. Listen, my friends, I know that life has challenged you. I know that we all have our shares of ups and downs, and sometimes situations can cause us to be offended even with God. But please be mindful of the fact that God knows something. He's keenly aware that we may not be able to put our hands on it right now, but we shall understand it better by and by. Listen, before you go, I want to offer Jesus Christ to you. Maybe you've been checking us out via YouTube. Maybe you've subscribed to our channel. And if you haven't, again, we encourage you to do that. We're, we're rolling to 1,000. We want you to do that. We want you to like us on Facebook. But more than that, we want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ. If you're not accepting him, as your Lord and Savior. Simply repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you died and rose again for my sins. I thank you for the sacrifice you made on Calvary. Come into my heart. I make you my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, just like that, you are saved. Salvation is a one-time ordeal, but sanctification is a process. So get in a Bible-based church, learn how to grow in God, and He'll take you to places that your eyes haven't seen and your ears haven't heard. Last but certainly not least, if you are ever in the Inslee area, I encourage you to drop by and be my special guest every Sunday morning, 8.34 and 10.04 a.m., 2505 Avenue B, which stands for blessed right here in this beautiful community of Inslee, Alabama. And we would love to see your face in the place. In the meantime, between time, remember this. One word can move you forward. I love you. I'll see you soon.